Dr. N. Sri Kumar is an assistant professor of philosophy in the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, Indian Institute of Technology, Madras. He is a gold medalist for ME Philosophy from the Mahatma Gandhi University, Kottayam. He did his MPhil and PhD in Philosophy from the Central University of Hyderabad and specializes in the areas of philosophy of language, continental philosophy and hermeneutics. He has been into the academic profession since 1995 and has taught in Sri Shankaracharya University of Sanskrit, Kaladi, Kerala and Bitspilani, Rajasthan before joining the IIT Midras in 2003. Dr. Sri Kumar has published articles in various journals and has presented papers in national and international seminars. Some of the courses he offers include European Philosophy, Contemporary German Philosophy, Introduction to Indian Philosophy, Philosophical Hermeneutics, Philosophy and Critical Theory and Philosophy of Language. Welcome to the UGC Lecture Series in Philosophy on Phenomenology and Existentialism Part 20. In this episode, we will be focusing on the following topics. Limitations of Eidetic Reduction. It is this concept of Eidetic Reduction we have examined in the last episode. So, we will be trying to see the limitations of this uh, uh, reduction, this stage of reduction rather and then afterwards the importance of transcendental reduction. According to many of Husserl's interpreters, it is this part of reduction that is the most important or rather the core of Husserl's phenomenological contemplations, where he introduces his transcendentalism with all its vigor. So, here we will see transcendental reduction. Then the transcendental ego, the concept of transcendental ego, this reasserts the importance Husserl had given to the concept of consciousness in his philosophy, in his phenomenological contemplations. Then empirical ego and pure ego, because transcendental ego is conceived as the pure ego. So, now we have to see its relationship with the empirical ego, which is a psychological ego, which is part of the world. So, these are the topics which we are going to examine in this episode. So, let us start with a quote by Herbert Spiegelberg from his phenomenological moment. It says that the primary function of all reduction is to prepare us for a critical stock taking of what is indubitably given before our interpreting beliefs rushing. So, this sums up the entire phenomenological project that before our beliefs rush in, we have to prepare us for a critical stock taking of what is indubitably given. This term indubitably given, the most immediately given, that is a concept which is at the center of Husserl's thought. Now, the different stages of reduction, before we proceed further, let us see, let us have a brief relook into the concept of reduction as such. Because when I say, when I talk about transcendental reduction, after having a brief discussion on adictic reduction, it gives the feeling that these two things are entirely different. So, according to many interpreters of Husserl, these three stages which I have listed out, the psychological phenomenological reduction, the adictic reduction and the transcendental reduction. It is not that Husserl had initially started with something, then moved to something else and finally concluded everything in transcendental reduction by rejecting the other two stages. That is not the case. Reduction is a process which involves, as I mentioned earlier, bracketing or suspension of beliefs, things like that. But in this final stage, we will be giving more importance to transcendental aspects or we will be focusing more on certain facts or certain data which are directly given to the consciousness. So, the different stages are not clearly articulated in Husserl's work as if it comes one after another. We will not find it in Husserl's work, these are all interpretations of Husserl's work. Then the process of bracketing is employed in all the three stages because a suspension of belief, you take away certain things in order to focus on certain other things which are more important. This is a process which is involved in all the three stages. Finally, bracketing is compared with, we can see 
Descartes' methodological doubt. Because Descartes also implies a kind of suspension of beliefs, where he proceeds with this methodological doubt, doubting everything that can be doubted. So, he doubts the very testimony of your sense organs and finally reaches a point. So, it is often compared with Descartes methodological doubt. And again the ultimate aim of phenomenological method is to expose the transcendental structures of consciousness. It is with regard to this aim we give importance to or we emphasize on transcendental reduction, the transcendental stage. Now, let us see the limitations of eidetic reduction. Eidetic phenomenology is only describing what is given to us, because the, the focus is on what is directly given, the essences which are given to the consciousness directly. So, it is only describing what is given to us. There are certain other things also, which are equally or more important as far as phenomenology is concerned. We are going to see it in this lecture. Phenomenology should not be equated with the use of eidetic method. Eidetic method is a method of locating and experiencing essences. So, phenomenology cannot be equated with that. There are something more to be achieved in phenomenological method in the program of phenomenology. Phenomenology should not be identified with the study of essences. This I have already mentioned. It is not just the study of essences, there are something more than that. In order to enter the real phenomenological domain, a mere transition from the natural observational attitude to the eidetic attitude is not sufficient. We have to focus on certain other more important things like the consciousness itself and also the pure ego. Now, the fundamental aim of phenomenology, this aspect, if you understand what is the fundamental aim of phenomenology, the importance of transcendental reduction will become clear. It is to free the phenomena from all trans phenomenal elements. We have seen you have to focus narrow down to the phenomena. Then again free from all beliefs in trans phenomenal existence. This is what is achieved precisely by the process of bracketing or suspension of beliefs. Then again focusing on what is indubitably or absolutely given. There is no presuppositions involved, no pre understandings involved, no attribution of meaning involved. What is indubitably or absolutely given is focused and not a matter of individuality versus generality as it is in the cases of eidetic reduction. This whole idea of individuality versus generality is important no doubt, but at the same time as I mentioned earlier it cannot be equated with the whole of phenomenological program. See let us see, see here you have a picture of a scientist who is experimenting something. So, there is apparently he has he is holding a test tube in which there are some chemical solutions. So, he also a scientist also is involved in a process of bracketing or suspension of commonsensical and other assumptions and beliefs. He is also focusing on what is uh, the there is a purpose for the scientist. What is the purpose? To see the basic structures for example, for a chemist the chemical structure the chemical properties of something. For a physicist it may be the physical properties whatever it is he is also engaged in a process of bracketing or suspension of beliefs. There is a goal for this process. So, now let us see with this understanding what happens in phenomenology and let me remind you that this process the bracketing or suspension process which a scientist carries out is not a negative process. It has a positive goal. Now, let us come to phenomenological reduction and let us conceive or let us see how we can go beyond phenomenological reduction. Reductions which involve suspension or bracketing are negative in approach definitely, because we are doing away with certain things which we already know. We are putting it in bracket, we are suspending them from our active considerations. So, the attitude or approach are basically negative. Again to what direction we can always ask this question, to what direction does the reduction head to? Again it moves away from the natural world, because the whole process of bracketing and suspension of beliefs which are integral to a phenomenological method involves 
a moving away from natural world, but then it moves away from natural world, but towards what does it move to? There should be a goal, there should be an end to which the whole process is directed to. What is it? What is the goal of this movement? Or rather we can reframe the question by asking what is the whole purpose of phenomenological reduction? It is to this the eidetic reduction fails to give an answer, satisfactory answer, the ultimate goal of reduction. Now let us see the ultimate goal of reduction, transcendental subjectivity is the goal. So, it is this whole concept of transcendental subjectivity that provides, that gives a direction for the phenomenologist to which he is heading to, to which the whole process of phenomenological reduction is aimed at, transcendental subjectivity. It indicates that here there is another quote from Spiegelberg. It indicates that reduction has the purpose to inhibit and quote unquote take back as it were all references to the transcendent as the intentional correlate of our acts and to trace them back to the immanent or transcendental acts in which they have their source. So, the process of tracing back to the immanent or transcendental acts in which they have their source. So, what is a source? It is this question which takes us to examine the whole concept of transcendental subjectivity. Why transcendental reduction? Again, the only means to uncover hidden intentional acts which project transcendent objects. So, transcendental reduction, no other process of reduction can do that to uncover the hidden intentional acts which project transcendent objects and attention to consciousness is needed here to uncover this the hidden intentional acts or rather in other words we can say the real nature of our cognitive process has to be understood. So, here we have to focus our attention on consciousness to have a better understanding about cognitive process. I mentioned earlier this is very important because phenomenology is conceived as a science of all sciences and all sciences involves cognition or all sciences is concerned about cognition. See phenomenology being a science of sciences is also interested to know what cognition is, what happens when we cognize something. So, to understand the cognitive process, to have a better understanding about the cognitive process, we have to understand the structure of consciousness or rather consciousness as such has to be examined. To completely overcome naturalism, this is again something which is underlined by Husserl, natural attitude, we have discussed this concept in detail earlier. The attitude from which, a standpoint from which we perceive the world, there are a lot of presuppositions, assumptions involved here and we have to or a phenomenologist has to completely overcome this natural attitude and it is here, this process of overcoming natural attitude is impossible to grasp the essential epistemological nature of cognition if we treat it as a factual process. I repeat, it is impossible to grasp the essential epistemological nature of cognition if we treat it as a factual process. What do you mean by treating it as a factual process? The process of cognition as a factual process. You treat it as a factual process implies that you are still in the natural attitude you are psychologizing it or you are naturalizing it, the whole cognitive process is a natural process. So, the traces of natural attitude we can see here and even after the eidetic reduction natural attitude prevails, we could see that even after that natural attitude prevails. So, we have to do something more. So, we have seen that even after the eidetic reduction the natural attitude prevails. So, how to overcome this? It is very important to overcome this. Free from the naturalistic outlook woven into our cognitive process. This says that our entire cognitive process, a naturalistic outlook prevails or it is interwoven with that. We have to get away from the tendency to naturalize the activities of consciousness. It is here a study of consciousness, focus to what happens in consciousness becomes important. So, we have to get away from the tendency to naturalize the activities of consciousness. Consciousness has an absolute existence, 
not akin to the existence of things in nature. So, it is here very important that we have to see consciousness, we have to conceive consciousness and perceive it as something entirely different from the objects in the world. It is not something which we find in, in the objective world, it is different from the things in the nature, what is it? And see the importance given to consciousness according to Husserl, see this is a quote from Husserl, without consciousness there would not be a world at all. So, even the world owes to consciousness for its very existence. So, this is the importance given to consciousness. So, the central role of consciousness plays in his philosophy. So, phenomenology has to study the realm of pure consciousness and the essential formations found there. So, you have to have a close study of consciousness, phenomenologist has to conduct it. So, here we will see three things, a proper understanding of the ego is essential, there is a fundamental problem with our understanding about the ego, the talk of ego brings the natural attitude into picture. So, our very conceptualization about the ego is problematic, because when we say ego, there is a tendency to conceive the ego as an empirical, as a psychological entity which is part of the world. The fundamental problem, this is what Husserl calls the fundamental problem with our understanding about the ego, because whenever we talk it brings the natural attitude into picture, because for us we almost equate the ego with the empirical ego which is part of the world. So, this is something which has to be overcome, this tendency, this temptation to naturalize ego has to be overcome. Ego, so let us see the general conception about the ego as an essentially non-physical entity causally interacting with the physical, we have this conception, it is not a physical entity, but it interacts with the physical objects because it knows. Let us remember about the Cartesian ego, which is very much interacting with the world, it knows the world, it is a thinking substance. So, it is non-physical even for Descartes, it is a thinking substance it is non-physical and non-extended, because extension is the essential attribute of physical objects according to Descartes and according to him thinking is the attribute of ego or mind. So, it is non-physical, but it is an entity which causally interact with the physical world. The ego and its acts are conceived in naturalistic terms, this is what is meant by understanding it in naturalistic terms. So, we need a different attitude, the talk of ego and its experiences already presupposes the truth of at least part of the general thesis of natural attitude. This is essentially a repetition of what I have been already discussing. When we talk about the ego, a general thesis of the natural attitude is presupposed, we have to somehow get rid of it. The method of epoch hey or bracketing must be extended even to my own ego and to its intention. So, Husserl wanted to start from where Descartes had stopped. Descartes stopped with the locating of the ego, the mind, the thinking substance, the conscious entity, but Husserl wants to apply the method of epoche even to this ego and let us see what remains when we bracket the ego and its intentions, what remains? It is here the whole concept of transcendental reduction becomes relevant, bracketing the ego and its intentions, we have to bracket the ego and its intentions and we cease to affirm the existence of the ego as a psychological reality, it is no longer a psychological entity like the Cartesian cogito, because we have already bracketed it, because the entire process of bracketing suspends all our beliefs about the existence of entities in the natural world. So, naturally the empirical ego also gets bracketed and the empirical or psychological ego has to be set aside. Now, why? So, as you have examined earlier the question, what is the direction toward which the entire process of bracketing is aimed at? To get access to the transcendental subjectivity or transcendental ego. So, what remains after this this whole process of reduction, bracketing of the ego is a transcendental subjectivity or transcendental ego which is a pure ego.
To this transcendental subjectivity, we have direct access through a transcendental experience. So, it is here the whole notion of transcendental experience becomes relevant. And this concept of transcendental experience is related to the notion of transcendental subjectivity, epoche, a form of transcendental experience. So, we are understanding epoche or rather reinterpreting the whole concept of epoche as a form of transcendental experience, where we get access to the transcendental subjectivity or transcendental ego. The epoche that brackets the empirical elements in consciousness and finally, leaves only the transcendent ego and its pure acts. This is what is aimed at. What leaves out only the transcendent ego and its pure acts. So, the reflection on these transcendental elements of consciousness is pure or it is called transcendental reflection. So, it is essentially different from we can see the eidetic reduction, because the reflection here is on transcendental elements and it seeks to affirm the existence of our acts as constituents of this psychological reality. So, there is no mention about any psychological reality at all. The ego becomes pure and transcendental, the very condition of all experience and in Husserl's words as we have seen earlier, the very condition of the existence of the world as such. It is because of that the world exists or for that the world exists. After all, these are there still remains an inner life of consciousness. This consciousness can be described independently of even those naturalistic affirmations which we have seen all even if you set aside all naturalistic affirmations the ego exists. It is the relationship is in such a way that the world exists for the ego and not vice versa. So, even if you suspend everything all naturalistic affirmations are set aside, the ego exists, because the ego is a very precondition for the very talk about anything in the natural world. And here again we see our intention so described are pure or transcendental acts of the ego. Finally, we are coming to that, the transcendental reduction when it is conducted reaches the ego and its transcendental acts. The ego that undergoes these acts is pure or transcendent ego and transcendental ego and its pure acts are the residue of transcendental reduction. Sometime back when we have examined, when we have started discussing the whole notion of reduction or the purpose of phenomenological method, we have seen that the ultimate purpose of phenomenological method is to see the ego, the end result of reduction is the residue of transcendental reduction is transcendental ego and its pure acts. Bracket, which is the result of bracketing all empirical theories about ego. We cannot have hold good any of these empirical theories about the ego, because we are no longer treating with the empirical ego. And again, let us not make any assumption about the truth of any of these theories of ego, because we are no longer concerned about that make no assumptions about what the ego is in fact like as a natural and empirical reality, because it is a transcendental reality here. So, let we can see that the strong influence of Descartes, if you examine this whole process of transcendental reduction, the concept of bracketing as it is practiced by Husserl, we can see the influence of Descartes. See, this is Descartes who is one of the most important thinkers of the history of western philosophy, who practiced a methodological doubt which is from where Husserl has derived lot of insights and Husserl is tremendously influenced by this method. Search for the ultimate grounds of meaning constituting acts, this is something which is carried out by Descartes in a systematic manner which we have examined earlier. The seed of transcendental philosophy can be found in Descartes very much. Descartes according to Husserl has failed in understanding the true significance of the cogito, because he has arrived at the cogito, the thinking substance and he says that Husserl says that he misconstructed the cogito or that ego as the thinking substance, as a mind which is extended. So, in a sense we could see the tendency of naturalizing in Descartes, in seeing the implications of his own transcendental approach. Descartes failed, 
the implications of his own transcendental approach he failed to see and again unable to free himself from the temptation of naturalizing consciousness as just another region of the world. This is something which you have already examined. So, this is where we, we find the strong influence of naturalism in Descartes and he as a consequence he fails to see the very important role the crucial role of the ego in his philosophy. Ego synthesizes our mental experiences into a single life. So, this is from here onwards we can see the influence of Kant in Husserl. The role of ego in synthesizing our mental experiences into a single life by giving it a unity. Ego is not a mere bundle of facts as David Hume had conceived it. It provides a unity for this acts. Mental processes are not isolated individual events, but they are united in the life of an individual ego or soul. So, this is very important as far as Husserl is concerned. And here let us see a quote from Dermot Moran from his introduction to phenomenology. Ordinary acts of perception has a temporal structure of retentions and anticipations and the unity of the ego's psychic life suggests that there is a unifying factor underlying the temporal spread of consciousness. There is, I repeat the last sentence, there is a unifying factor underlying the temporal spread of consciousness. This is something which is missed out by Descartes. It describes our experiences as we leave them. See, let us see pure ego, the transcendental subjectivity. Now, we conceive it as the ultimate residue of transcendental reduction. It is important to see the role or the way in which the ego, the empirical ego or the cogito is related to the pure ego. Every cogitato come and go because they are empirical, they come and go, but pure ego appears to be necessary in principle. It is a very condition of all experiences and pure ego remains absolutely self identical in all possible changes of experience. That is what precisely provides all our experiences the kind of unity which it has. And again it is not a real part of phase of our experience, it is beyond that, it is a very condition of experience. Experiences belong to ego and we can say that ego belongs to experiences, this is very important. And all of them as belonging to one single stream of experience, the essential unity is provided by the ego, the pure ego. The ego leaves it life in a special sense in every actual cogito and the I think of the Cartesian I think must accompany all my potentialities no doubt. And Descartes failed to realize this because he stopped with the locating of the ego which is the empirical ego and failed to proceed to the transcendentalization of this ego because he was influenced by the naturalizing outlook which was prevalent in his age. So, we can see that experiences of an object being directed toward an object, being occupied with an object, these are the various experiences of an object we have, adopting an attitude, undergoing something, all these are acts, all these acts are something from the ego, it presupposes the ego and experience necessarily involves the ego, we cannot get rid of the ego, wherever there is a talk of experience there is a ego. The pure ego is the necessary prerequisite for all experiences to occur and it is the most important and the most problematic of Husserl's methodological devices because it talks about transcendentalism and this whole talk about transcendentalism makes the Husserlian project a little ambiguous because there are a lot of interpretations about what transcendentalism, what is Husserlian transcendentalism, what is meant by transcendental ego and there are a lot of Indian thinkers who compare Husserl with Indian philosophy because Indian philosophy is also concerned about pure consciousness, pure ego and things like that. But we have to understand that these are two different traditions and crucially 
important this whole idea is because it explicitly reveals the structures of consciousness that are the subject matter of Husserl's phenomenology. We will discuss this concept of pure ego and the whole notion of pure consciousness in the, the subsequent lectures. We will wind up now and before that let us see the summary. The need for transcendental reduction, this is the main theme which we have examined in this episode, the need for a transcendental reduction after seeing the limitations of eidetic reduction. And what happens the result of transcendental reduction, we have seen that pure ego and its acts appear as the residue of transcendental reduction. And the concept of transcendental ego we have examined briefly and we have compared it with the concept of empirical ego as well. So, the concept of transcendental ego and with this the students can take up some questions. Number 1, what is the ultimate objective of transcendental reduction? Number 2, in what ways the pure ego is different from the empirical ego? Number 3, why is it called the transcendental ego? With this we will wind up this episode, thank you.